Welcome everyone to the Drush Optimizations Lab. Uh, we have two hours here um, learning all about uh, Drush and development workflows and how to write commands. Um, and so, you know, we're very excited to um, further along your skills with Drush. Just want you guys to take a look and um, review the goals that we have for the lab and make sure this is the right place for you. Um, we're going to show you how to add Drush integration for contrib modules. Um, learning how to configure and customize Drush for your own workflow. Talk to you about some internals, especially internals that are new for Drupal 6. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to have general, like, a Q&A at the end here. So if you've been meaning to chat with the Drush maintainers, here we are, and we'd love to talk to you. A little bit of housekeeping before we get into the program. Um, if you have questions or you need help, um, there's two different processes for that. Um, if you have a question for the presenter, um, raise your hand high and look up here towards Greg when he's presenting. Um, if you're doing something on your machine and you run into trouble, um, there's lots of us here to help. Um, just raise your hand about halfway and start looking at one of us over here, okay? And we'll be happy to come over to your machine when we get a second and help. Um, I'm going to have the whole panel introduce themselves now. I'll go first. My name is Mosh Weitzman. I'm the Drush maintainer. I work for Acquia as the director of research and development. I'm a longtime Drupal developer as well. Um, so uh, why don't we start with Damien here? Yeah, I'm Damien Lee. I'm an engineer at Acquia, um, a core contributor, but I also maintain views, diesels, and a few other Drush commands. Hi everyone, my name is Juan Pablo. I like to be called, oh, I like to be called Juan P. I work for Lullabot as a developer, and I wrote a book on Drush a year and a half ago. My name is uh, Jeannie Finks, and I work as a, I manage a Drupal support team at Acquia. I'm based in Boston, United States. And I've been building and managing a Drupal site since 2007. And last, <laughs> but not least. Uh, Stefan Kolosket, score on Drupal.org. Uh, I work at Acquia and Drupal Gardens engineering team. And um, yeah, uh, I contribute to Drupal 6, uh, Drupal 7 core. Hi everyone, I'm Greg Anderson. I'm going to be your presenter today. Um, I started contributing to Drush in 2009. I've been a co-maintainer since 2010. I'm the original author of some useful features like site aliases and SQL sync. Um, so thank you all for coming to the lab today. All right, hope um, most people brought laptops. Um, get them out and uh, we're gonna start using them now. If you don't have one, hopefully your neighbor can let you look on. Um, pair programming is definitely a great way to go, so um, hopefully everyone at least has a computer to look onto. All right, I'm going to call up Greg. Um, let's get started. All right, good afternoon. It's great to see everyone here today. First of all, I want to tell you a little bit about our backup plan. I was told that we should count on the internet failing, and so I've done exactly that. Uh, if for some reason you can no longer use the internet, you can switch over to our access point, which has an SSID of Drush Lab. If you're hooked up to this access point, you won't have any internet whatsoever, but uh, that's no problem, uh, because you're going to be able to pull the slides up from drush.org slash prog and you're also going to be able to run Drush PM download for any 7.x contrib module. I've got a whole clone of Drupal.org up here. So if, if later you're uh, going in and you want to write a Drush command for some contrib module and it's not on your machine, you can still download it. We 
which might happen if I mention something along the way. Um, but I'm also hoping that many of you today have brought your own dev sites and might get into making Drush commands for the contrib modules that you already use or maintain. Uh, I'll so just add that um, that URL, drush.org slash prog, go ahead and download that to your machines, that PDF, uh, just in case um, it's good to have it locally. The other thing you can do is copy and paste from the demos that we have put there and the exercises we have there. So go yeah. ahead and get that. Yeah, that's a great point. So the slides are available in PDF form at that URL, and you'll find them at that URL both on the real internet and the fake Drush Lab internet. So go ahead and pull them down, and you can follow along as we go. So I would like to make a little announcement. I think probably almost everyone in this room has probably already noticed that Drush is now on GitHub. And we made this transition a little while ago, just before the release of uh, Drush 6. And I would say that uh, overall, GitHub is working pretty well for us. Uh, we moved there because uh, we were having continual frustrations with the Drupal.org module versioning scheme, which makes a lot of sense for a contrib module that's tied to a given release of Drupal, but didn't make a lot of sense for Drush since Drush works with multiple versions of Drupal, and we're, uh, people were always saying, you know, which version of Drush goes with Drupal, or the 8.x, 7.x branch doesn't work with Drupal 7, does it? But they were wrong, it did. Um, so now it's just very simple. We've got right on the uh, home page the list of all of the branches, which are now much simpler now, what version of PHP you need, and what version of Drupal it works with. And this is a really good place to go if you're considering pulling master. So a lot of people ask, um, you know, is it safe to use the dev versions of Drush? And most of the time it is. All of the maintainers use today's head in their day-to-day -day work. Um, so it's not terribly unsafe for you to pull that. But of course, we do sometimes break head. We try never to, uh, but if we do, do break head, you can go here and see, that'll say build failing. You can just not pull on that day. Um, the 6.x branch, of course, is a lot safer than master. Anything that's stable from master that we put in, we're gonna backport to the, uh, the 6.x branch. So if you wanna keep up to date, uh, you can do that. Of course, if you're using Drupal 8, you have to be on the master branch. So the, um, the Travis integration and Inline comments have been great. Uh, pull requests have been great. Um, we've had some challenges, like pull requests, for example. Uh, <laughs> makes it a little challenging when you have multiple people working on the same patch compared to Drupal.org. Um, but you know, overall, it's been working out just fine. All right, as we go through the slides today, you'll notice that a lot of the slides are labeled with exercises. An exercise is something we're all going to do together. They're all pretty simple. It should just take a minute uh, to type it in so you can see things working and understand what we're talking about. Uh, it's not necessary for you to do the exercise if you don't want to, but it's uh, helpful and recommended, and it'll help get you started for the lab portion at the end once the presentation is over. Other slides are labeled demo, and these are things that I'm going to show you um, but you don't need to type them in yourself. You certainly can, but if you skip it, you won't fall behind. Uh, and finally, near the end, I have a few bonus things in the slides. And these are examples that I'm not even gonna show you, but you can go back and try it on your own later, uh, maybe in the hands-on lab portion after the presentation or, or maybe later. So the presentation portion is going to go through several stages of Drush. I'm going to start off showing you how to make custom commands for Drush. And uh, even if you're an old hand at, at making Drush commands, 
this should still be an interesting part for you because I'm going to introduce the new output format feature from Drush 6. Uh, then I'm going to go through a couple of simple Drush techniques you can use that are useful and describe some ways that you can use Drush hooks and Drush configuration to make your development life a little easier. Apologize for the pause as I'm not going to get through this all. I don't <laughs> keep hydrating. If you want to create a custom command for Drush, it's really easy, and there are tons of resources all over the place. The often overlooked Drush topic section has topics on all sorts of different things. You should always go there if you're looking for information on Drush, and in particular, docs commands and docs example commands will show you how to write Drush commands. Uh, APRESS very kindly allowed me to put the Drush chapter of the Definitive Guide of Drupal 7 uh, online as a sample chapter for free download. This is covering Drush 4, um, but it's actually still surprisingly relevant for uh, even Drush 6 and Drush 7, although we've added some features, the information in there is still useful. Um, there are some Drush command file snippets. You can follow that link when you download the slides. If you're a Sublime Text 2 user, a few macros will get you a skeleton that you can use to start writing a Drush command. Um, and then we also have an example command that will show you XKCD cartoons. And of course, all of the uh, Drush commands inside of the commands folder are also excellent examples that you can use to base your work on. Um, I'm not going to show you any of that. You can find it later. Uh, but I am going to show you the uh, new Drushify tool. This is a simple code generator that you can run on the command line. And it will very quickly throw together a little Drush command for your module. So first, I'm going to show you an XKCD example. And hopefully, you have the slides downloaded if you want to be a smart guy or gal and run this yourself. Uh, there we go. So the XKCD command, I ran it. It looked up some metadata on the internet, or the fake internet, actually. And it pulled up this little XKCD cartoon. Now, I'm showing you this not only to show you how cool Drush commands are, but I also wanted to show you this particular cartoon. Maybe you've seen it before. If you're an XKCD command uh, fan, it talks about how long people spend building tools versus how much time it really saves them. And it's sort of a humorous piece. Uh, you know, we all are very interested in efficient processes, and sometimes we spend more time being efficient than um, it's really worth. So he's asking, is it worth it? Uh, and the graph is completely you know, accurate in terms of the, the, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between time spent and time saved. But he really kind of sells short the idea of uh, modernizing and making your life more efficient with uh, tooling because of many reasons. Uh, one thing is that the time you save doesn't just pay back to you. It pays back to the whole community, especially in Drupal where your Drush commands can go into contrib and they can go into your contrib module, and then other people who are using that module will also save a ton of time uh, by being able to do things with your module on the command line. Um, a side benefit of having Drush commands just beyond the efficiency is it makes great sample code for people learning about how your module works, because there's a very regular template for Drush commands. You can go in and say, hey, you know, here's a Drush command that adds a new foo. And you can look at the implementation of that, and there's the API for creating foos. And if you need to put that into your module file instead of calling it from Drush, it's easy for you to do that. And uh, finally, not all time is created equal. You know, if it's the end of the day, and there's an emergency, and you just need to get something done, and you can do it in two minutes with a Drush command, and it would have taken you 30 minutes without, well, 
um, you're probably going to value those 25 minutes you saved a lot higher than um, if it happened in a non-critical time. So I just wanted to go over all of that to encourage everyone here, you know, if you're in this lab, I'm sure you're really interested in um, automation. Um, I want to tell you that, uh, you know, there's benefits to that beyond the obvious. Oh yes, back to the slide. You can look at this setup later. Um, the xkcd command is in the examples folder, which isn't searched by default. You can either copy it over or put it in your dash i, dash i example. Okay, so. Um, we have now reached our first exercise. I'm going to do a demo for you of the new Dreshify command. But if you're fast, you can run the whole demo and be done with it before I even finish describing it. So it's that quick. So the first step is to just go to your command line and type Drush hello. This is your control to prove that I'm not pulling a fast one on you. I didn't write the Drush command in master and sneak it in so you'd accidentally pull it. You should get an error that says the Drush command hello could not be found. So the next step is to type in Drush DL Drushify and that will automatically go out to drupal.org either on the real internet or the fake internet and uh, download this tool. And it automatically puts it in your home.drush folder where Drush can find it, and it automatically clears the Drush command cache. You always have to say Drush CC Drush if you ever do anything that modifies the uh, commands. But if you're using a Drush command to add your Drush command, it'll do that for you. So uh, after you've downloaded Drushify, just type in Drush Drushify hello. What this will do is it says, we want to make a new command file called hello, and there's an invisible second parameter here, which is the name of the command that you want to create. If you don't give your command a name, it names it the same thing as your command file. So this is going to make a command file named hello with a hello command in it. If you are successful in doing that, you can then type drush hello again and it should give you a little message. It says not just hello world, but it gives you a whole table of hello world in different languages. And I did that so that we could demonstrate output formats. So does anyone have that running yet? <coughs> yep, okay, cool. So I'm gonna do it quickly for those who don't have laptops or those in our studio audience. <laughs> Oh, I think I forgot to erase my hello command. Oh, good, I did remember to erase it. Oh yeah, and there's one more feature of Drushify that I forgot to mention before. You notice that it just opened up an editor that has the, the command that it just created in the editor. Because uh, unless you're actually writing the hello world command, you're probably going to want to edit this command right away. So you can just Scroll on down to the command implementation here, which is drush hello, and you can change the implementation from hello world to whatever you want to write. And we'll return to this demo a little later. Oh, sorry, question, is that for, question for me? Yes. Oh, the Drushify command is an external Drush command. It's, it's, it's on drupal.org as a contrib module. So that's why you had that step uh, to download it because it's not, it's not part of Drush. And it works with Drush 5, it works with Drush 6, it works with Drush 7. Um, if you run it with Drush 6 or later, you get output formats. If you run it with Drush 5, it just says hello world with no table uh, because Drush 5 doesn't support output formats. So 
So basics of output formatting. In the past, if you wanted to produce output with a drush command, you would just uh, print it. Oh, and I've got a stealth bug here. Th there's actually a drush print command that you should use instead of the PHP print command. I apologize for that. Um, <coughs> but in drush 6, instead of printing your output, you should return it. And when you return a data structure from a primary drush command hook in drush 6 or later. Greg, can I pause you for one yep. second? For people who are still on the Drushify example, don't do this from inside of a Drupal site, <coughs> okay? Because you're trying to create a command um, and it won't work from inside the Drupal site. So go CD out of Drupal and do Drush, Drush, Drushify hello and then it will write out a file and you'll then you will have the command available to you. That's a really good point. Yeah. If, you're in <laughs> if you're inside a Drush command and you say Drushify hello, it's going to look for a module named hello. And it says no module found. And this, yeah. mod this Drushify command is all of two weeks old, so it's not very happy in terms of error cor uh, correction. But besides CDing out of your Drupal site, another thing you can do is you can say drush at none drushify, because uh, the none site alias will tell drush to ignore the CWD and act as if you are outside of a drush context. And then you can write a drush extension that's not part of a module. So if drushify sees that you're creating a command file when you're not inside of a Drupal root, then it creates something inside of your home.drush folder, which should be implemented. Drushify does? It should work with Drushify. Oh, to open the editor. Oops. Okay, so I, on, I only tested with like 5x and 6x and master. Okay, 5, 8 and up is the requirement for Drushify. Great. All right, are we ready to go on? Yeah, so if you return data, Drush is going to render it for you now. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was drifting away from it. Is that better? Oh, okay. Yeah, the question, it was more of a comment. Um, the Drushify command only works with 5.8 and higher. If you use a really old version of Drush, it doesn't have a utility function that I'm using and it gives you an error message. Okay. So the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, the format option. Uh, Drush provides many built-in formatters that work with uh, all Drush core commands that uh, you know, produce formatted output. There are array formatters, and an array formatter can take any array and uh, print it out, no matter what its structure is. So there are examples of this are like you know var export and printr and uh, yaml and and json. Uh, Drush does all of these by default. You know, so in the old days, when you were using a Drush command and you used dash dash pipe to get machine parsable output, you only had one choice, uh, and different commands would make a different choice about what output format to use. Uh, but now you can specify dash dash format and see your output all sorts of different ways. Uh, there are also lists with various separators, so it's really easy to make a comma separated list or a space separated list. And uh, tables, as we saw with the Drushify command, can be easily formatted from a relatively complex, convenient for machines, two-dimensional array into something that's readable for humans. So commands return data and formatters render them. So uh, you can follow along with this. We're just going to run the drush hello command, which uses output formatters, and we're going to uh, format it in different ways. So first we'll do var export. Do you want the terminal larger? And moved up. Sorry? And higher. Move the terminal higher, okay. 
I don't want to type clear because it's just going to drift to the bottom. So I want to make the terminal smaller so the bottom is actually visible. How's that? Can you see yes. the bottom now? Good? Yep. Reasonable? Okay, format equals var export. This is your most useful format as a developer because this will show you <coughs> the data structures exactly as the drush command returned it. Um, and of course, you've already seen the output without any formatter. You can see how it takes this array and prints it in a table. Um, but if you don't want to see it in PHP, you can also see it in JSON or YAML, all sorts of useful stuff. Again, if anyone wants uh, help, we have lots of people up here. You know, if your hello command isn't working, we're happy to help you get that working. Okay, so if you're following along, open up the file that um, Drushify opened for you and scroll through the, um, the file until you get to the command record. If you're defining an output format for your command, the first thing you need to do is specify what the default and pipe format should be. Um, and that's done in a very straightforward way. Um, the pipe format is following along in the footsteps of Drush 5 and earlier, the dash dash pipe command or option that I mentioned earlier in Drush 5 and earlier will output uh, code in a machine parsable format. And that flag is still available in uh, Drush 6 or later. Uh, so your output format just needs to say by default uh, what format is best for your command when someone uses dash dash pipe. The next thing that you need to specify is the output data type. Um, and here we've picked format table. There are a number of available output data types a format table is what we just saw with the hello world command. It's an array of arrays uh, with rows and columns. Format list is a simple one dimensional array that might be an associative array with keys or it just might be a, a keyless array. And a format single means simply a single string. Uh, then there's also one funny data type if uh, you want to say that your data structure is just weird and it's not usable by any of these other uh, commands, or sorry, format types, uh, but you do want to be able to format it with var export, YAML, JSON, and so on and so forth, then you just set the uh, outputter to, or the output format type to true, which uh, somewhat regrettably is how, how you get into this situation. Um, but the reason for this is if you don't specify the output format at all, then you're just telling Drush that you can't predict what your output is going to look like, and the user is then allowed to select any formatter, some of which might give you runtime errors if it can't render the output that the command produced. So the reason that we specify our output formats by type instead of just listing all of the formats that our command supports is that uh, Drush allows you to add more output formatters. Like at the moment, there's no XML output formatter, but you could write one in a Drush extension and register it with uh, Drush and say that um, you know, it will accept any of these data types and then a user will be able to say format equals XML and that will work with all of the commands that have declared that they work with that data type. Little tiny bit more work for you, but it gives us a more flexible system for adding unanticipated data types. Drush also does a lot of nice work for you in terms of managing fields, and we'll see this in some of the demos that are coming up. In order to do this, um, all you need to do is specify your field labels and your field defaults. The field labels 
is just a, an often very, very long list that maps from the machine readable ID for your column or field to the human readable string that you want to appear in the text output. And uh, fields default lists which fields should actually appear in the output. Because sometimes your command produces tons and tons and tons of data in the array, um, which is useful for machines that are calling it, but you don't want to see all of that data by default. And we'll see how this works in some of the following slides. So <coughs> I'm just gonna demo this quickly. If you want to follow along, you may. So the first thing I'm going to do is use the dash dash fields command to specify that I only want to see the message field. And you can see there that it just shaves off um, the language. Or if I tell it that I want to see the language field, it shaves off the message. Or we can reverse the order and say I want to see the message first and the language second. If you want, you can also shave off the field labels and keep the data the same. So for example, if you run drush status and ask for just the drush configuration line, then you will see this big list of um, files that drush loaded for your configuration. But if you wanted to parse this output, then you might want to add in a field labels equals zero. Um, so if you just set this to zero, instead of listing the fields you want, you say, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to see any of the field labels. And then the field labels go away. Now you have a space delimited list of file paths and you can parse that nicely. Moving right along, here is a mapping that shows the thing I was describing earlier. <coughs> Here's your field labels that maps from language to language and message to message. And uh, if your command result outputs an array of rows, each row having columns that are tagged with this machine key, then you can see that the, the data from the command output appears in the body of the table and the field from the field labels, clearly enough, shows up up at the top. Okay, that's fairly straightforward. So here's our next exercise. We are going to see how these uh, commands that I just showed you work in practice by adding an extra field into the hello output. select that so that I can quickly come on over here and paste in English for the first one. And then the next one I believe is easy. Tell me if I got that wrong. And finally the all important Klingon is PLH case your users absolutely have to know the uh, ISO code for Klingon. Now, if we run Drush Hello, you will notice that the output hasn't changed. And I'm going to go on to the next example to explain why that is. <coughs> I haven't defined these fields, and since the field's not defined, Drush is going to ignore it. So now I'm going to go ahead and say that the code label is the ISO 639-2 language code. And that is up here in the command record. So we're going to paste that in to the field labels section 
inside of your output format. And we are also going to modify field default. Let's not modify field default yet. Let's run drush hello and see what it does. So there we go. We've defined the, what the, the label looks like, but the output is still the same because our default field does not include the code output. So now I'm gonna come on over here to the field default and say in addition to lang and message, we're also going to put in code. Save that. And then when I run drush hello again, now you can see that it's added one more field. Oh, I need to move my terminal over. There you go. That's better. Okay, is that clear? Yeah, so that leftmost column there is new. That just finally showed up after those steps. Yeah, so you should see the, the ISO 392 column here if you successfully added those things. So hopefully you have the slides so you can see, but uh, here on the screen, is that big enough? I can make that a little bigger. And for those of us who uh, walked in a little later after the start, the slides and some of the other resources for this session can be found at um, drush.org slash prog. And uh, I guess this just highlights the fact that um, drush commands often have more fields available to you than what are shown when you run the command by default, all right? So if you go look at the help for the command, you'll often see the additional fields that you can request if you want to. We try not to bombard everyone with everything we know about each module, for example. So is that enough time for this exercise? I'll move on, you can continue to work on it. If anyone needs any help or has questions, just you know, raise your arm at us. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the Drush technique section. Uh, the first thing I wanna show you is uh, hopefully a lot of you are already using this feature. It's the ever useful Drush quick dr uh, Drupal command. And this one command will fire up a complete Drupal site for you for your testing pleasure. The first command, or the first argument is the name of the folder that you want your Drush command or your, your Drupal site to be written into. And following the first argument is just a list of modules that you would like to download and enable at the same time that you're installing the site. So for this exercise, I'd strongly recommend that you include Devel. If you don't include that, some of the later stuff won't work. Um, Aug and CCK are what I recommend, but if you're feeling wild and crazy, you can uh, pick some different modules that you want. Or um, if you feel like it, even though I labeled this an exercise instead of a demo, if you've brought your own Drupal site, this is actually an optional exercise, uh, so you can choose to just use the one you've already bought, brought. Yes? Yeah, no, I, I got it. Um, so, so the very, oh yes, uh, sorry, I'll repeat the question. So the question is, uh, can you get rid of this extra schlock that uh, Drush makes? And um, because it makes a very long name for the root folder, and then inside that it makes a folder named uh, Drupal. Um, so the first, the answer to the first half of that question is that the first argument, if you specify a first argument here, then you won't get that very long name folder. It'll instead be named uh, just prog. And I don't have, you know, as Mosh mentioned, sometimes the option list for dr Drush commands or Drush fields are really, really long. I don't have all of the site install or QD options memorized. We can look for that during the lab. But off the top of my head, I don't think you can get rid of that 
Drupal folder. Um, for my part, I really like to have that folder there. Um, I don't call it Drupal, I call it htdocs. Uh, and usually the root folder I name after my site. And the reason I do that is that um, I'm still checking in my whole Drupal site into Git for revision control. And so having one extra folder that's outside of the Drupal site allows me to check in assets that don't belong inside the Drupal root. Um, now if QD and SI do not have an option to get rid of that field or that second folder, I think that's an excellent feature request and uh, you know, patches are welcome. Uh, if, if you're really nice, someone might even write it for you, but you know, I could imagine an option where you give it the name that you want that folder to be or you set it to zero following the Drush convention uh, if you just want it to go away. So it would be easy to add that feature, but I don't think anyone's written that yet. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to mention, if you're running QD and you do not have SQL Lite installed on your uh, computer, then you can, instead of using SQL Lite, specify the specific database that you would like to use. And hopefully you have some SQL database on your computer. I guess that <laughs> everyone at DrupalCon must. Um, so if you're not using SQLite, then you have to create the database yourself with MySQL admin. Um, there are some Drush demands like SQL sync that will do a create DB as a service, but uh, QD currently is not one of them. That would be another good feature request. So I'm going to just uh, quickly fire off this command. Oops. Don't click in a presentation. It goes to the next slide. I need to hit escape first. If you run quick Drupal and you get an error about the run server um, part not working, uh, it means that your PHP is not quite set up um, enough uh, to, to use run server, but your Drupal site is functional. Um, you just can't look at it through a web browser. It'll, it'll function in Drush. That's right. Yeah. I was, the comment from the field was uh, there's a no server option that you can skip the run server part with, which, it, which is true. It is a harmless error, though. Yeah, harmless error. Yes, it should, if everything's running correctly, it should take you all the way through the install process. Um, we had a uh, funny little feature request in the Drush issue two once about this message here that says, this takes a few seconds, and our contributor said that maybe it should say something like, you know, this takes inextricably long, or go get a coffee, or something like that. <laughs> uh, but I timed this, and if you're running the same one that I am, it only takes about a minute to go through the whole thing. Now, a minute's a really long time in a presentation, or if you're uh, sitting in a lab wondering if it's going to work or not, but it's really not that much time out of your life. So just let this run in the background, and eventually, if your run server is set up, you will get a browser window that will open up. Um, and this browser window is also gonna show up on my system. It may or may not uh, interfere with my presentation, but if I'm suddenly interrupted by a Drupal site, it's just uh, our exercise working correctly. So if you're not um, finished with this exercise yet, or if it's still spinning, don't worry about it. Just put that terminal session aside and open up another one. We were actually going to use this example Drupal site way at the end um, when we're doing the, the open collaboration. We won't use it during the other parts. Um, we may use it in a demo though, so keep it handy. If you, oh, here it is. See, I mean it can go by pretty fast when you're gabbing. Um, so the site install command just finished on my computer, and you can now see that I named my site Prague, so Drupal cleverly tells me welcome to Prague, and I now have a site with AUG, CCK, and Devel that's all ready to go. We will come back to that later.
So the next thing I want to show you is uh, Drush FN hook. So if you're following along, you'll, you'll need your site. Um, so be sure to change your working directory to the site that you just created, which should be in a folder called prog slash Drupal. That's your Drupal root, as we discussed in the previous question. And uh, then we're going to run Drush FN hook menu. This is a really super useful command. It's provided by Devel, um, which we cleverly just downloaded. So I'm changing my Drupal root into the site that I just created, and now I'm going to type drush fn hook menu. And now drush is going to go and look at all of the enabled modules in that Drupal site, and it's going to give me a really long list of all of the modules that enable or that implement the menu hook. Um, and I'm going to just arbitrarily say I would like to see Aug's implementation of hook menu. And my font is big, so it kind of overflowed. But you can see here's the, the implementation of uh, Aug menu. And it also shows you the comment that appears in the source code before the function definition, the file name that the uh, function definition appears in, which, no surprise, is a dot module file. And it also shows you which lines it appears on. Yes. Can we split this output into pages? Sure, we can type it through more. And drum roll. Oh, darn it. No, you can't. Um, well, not really. It, it's not really an, an impossibility. Let's control C on out of here. <coughs> this is a good segue into my next demo. This, uh, you can see here that it told me that hook menu is called aug menu. We pretty much all know that already, but if you didn't, there it is. You can see it. So now instead of using um, fn hook, we're going to come on over here. Can you read that if I don't full screen it? <laughs> we're going to use fn view instead of fn hook. And this will do the same thing, but we give it exactly the file or the function that we want to see. Say drush fn hook aug menu. <coughs> Oops. Sorry. I was trying to type the right command, but somehow my fingers had other ideas. OK, and there we get the same output, and now the problem with fn hook is that it had interactive output, um, which got in the way of more. But since we're using fn view here, we can pipe it through more, and you get a pager. Um, there are some Drush commands, like Drush topic, that will do a pager for you, and so that would be a good uh, feature request. We could add that to Drush, or to actually to Devel. You'll have to track down the Devel maintainer and ask him. And another really cool function that I like is uh, Drush EV, which just, uh, or PHP eval, it's the full name of the command. And this function just runs a little snippet of PHP. But of course, it does a full bootstrap of your Drupal site first. So this is a handy way to um, find out if there's some function. Oh, darn it. Got to escape out of this again. OK, here we go. Escape. I'm going to select this so I can run it. If you found some function and you're curious how it works, I'm going to run this on the sample site first, just so you can see. Um, it's going to bootstrap the site. Oh, yes, no wonder it got strange output. Thank you. Drush ev, this command. So if I, if I found this function called drush get entity groups, um, and I want to know what it returns, then I can just use ev to find it. Um, now, of course, 
Drush EV is not a replacement for your full IDE that let you do full source code um, debugging, but you know sometimes you just want to see really quickly what the function is, and you don't want to have to open up the window and set your breakpoints and um, run the, your command in the context of the debugger. So it's the right tools for the right time. Um, if you run this command, if you're following along and you run it on the site you just built, it's going to produce no output because, of course, you don't have any groups and you don't have any memberships. Um, but I have another site, so I'm just showing you here that uh, EV of this function does, in fact, return an interesting structure, and you can see there's a node in there, and there's an, as an associative array that goes from a 2 to a 252, and if you use this in conjunction with reading the source code, it'll give you some insights into how this function works, because you can see its output. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Um, I typed return and then I called to the function. Uh, you could also do a printr or a print or a var export and that would work the same way. But now the ev command supports uh, formatters. And the nice thing about this, if I say print, then I get only, you know, what the command prints. But if I run it with return, then uh, I can use a uh, format equals JSON. And if you, for some reason, want to see your array in JSON, then you don't have to type out JSON decode, or JSON encode, I mean. <laughs> Again, there's many different ways to do things. They're all gonna work out pretty well, um, but the right tool for the right time, uh, I find that uh, Drush EV can be really useful. just skip the other demo. You don't really need to see the output of node load. All right, so um, <coughs> next up I'm going to show some interesting little Drush hooks uh, that will help you uh, optimize different steps that you do frequently. Drush has a uh, very complicated hooking system that allows you um, to modify the way a command works, either by doing something before the command executes or uh, after the command executes. And uh, true to the Drupal pattern, the way that you hook functions is that you carefully compose a function name that matches a pattern and it has your uh, command file name inside of the pattern and uh, also has the name of the function that uh, you'd like to hook. And sometimes it's hard to figure out exactly what um, pattern you should use if you want to write a hook for some new Drush command. So a, a useful way to figure out what your hooks are is to use the dash dash show invoke global function. And this is going to print out all of the hooks for all of the Drush command files uh, for the command that you run. Um, and in this particular example, I am interested in only the hooks that have to do with my new hello command. So I'm going to redirect standard error to standard output and type that through grep hello. So let's see what that looks like exactly the same as the slide, but there it is in all of its glory, but with color disabled for some reason. The next hook that I want to show, or the first hook I want to show, is the uh, post PM enable hook. And this is a really useful hook to patch into if you have a contrib module that has uh, external libraries. Now, a lot of times if you're using a module 
um, that needs some other library, then you, you have to read the project page and it says go to this website and download this tarball and find the right folder to uncompress it. Um, and this is a bunch of additional steps that your user has to do before you can start using your module. Now there's quite a few modules that implement a post enable hook to download these dependencies automatically and Devel is an one example of it. When you enable the Devel module, it automatically runs a uh, download function to go and get the uh, Firecore PHP extension and it extracts it in the right place. So when you're using the Drushify command to uh, create a new command template, it's automatically going to put one of these post enable hooks in as just a hint that you should really think about implementing one of these if you have external libraries that, that need to be downloaded. If you don't have any external libraries, you can just, of course, delete this uh, function. Next up is the sync enable hook. Inside of the Drush examples folder, there's a command file called syncenable.drush.inc. And if you'd like to use this feature, all you need to do is copy that example command file over to your uh, .drush folder in your home directory. If you do this, then um, there are going to be additional options available after SQL sync. And one of those options is uh, dash dash enable, which takes a list of modules to enable. Another example is dash dash disable, which takes a list of modules that you'd like to, to disable. And if you take these features and uh, combine it with Drush site aliases and uh, command the command specific feature, you can make yourself a little record that says, um, you know, whenever this alias is the target of an SQL sync command that I want to use the enable option to enable devel and stage file proxy. Um, and then the sync enable also has a, a permissions setting feature. So you can tell it that I want access devel information to always be enabled. So this way, if you sync from your live site to your uh, dev site, then you don't have to go through the steps of saying, oh my gosh, you know, I forgot to do something obvious, like enable the access devel information, and that's why um, I can't see the, the tabs in my, my debugging, which is very useful to not have to continue to remember the same thing again and again. So this has been in, in the Drush examples folder for a long time. So as an aside, um, a couple of times people have asked me about the sync enable hook and say, well, can I also set variables every time I SQL sync my site? And the answer to that is no, that feature isn't there and it wouldn't be difficult to add it, uh, but there's no point in adding it because the better way to do that is to just use the Drupal function uh, to put overrides inside of your settings PHP file. And then those are always there and you don't need to worry about changing the database every time you SQL sync it. <coughs> so the next hook I wanted to talk about was the uh, sanitize hook. Uh, SQL sync has a feature, you can pass dash dash sanitize and it'll do its best to uh, clean up uh, any user data that may be <coughs> sensitive. Uh, but Drush is extensible, so if there are contrib modules that may add additional tables that might contain sensitive information, like you know social security numbers or um, bank account numbers or missile, missile launching codes or something like that, then you can add your own hook that will uh, clear out the functions that, or the, sorry, the, the fields of the tables that you add. And it's really easy to use. Uh, all you have to do is uh, generate some SQL that you want to run on a sanitize operation and uh, register a post sync op by calling this uh, 
struct API function, and uh, then your cleanup function will happen at the end of the sanitize. So, yes. Uh, you have to put this hook into your drush.inc file inside of your module. So you can use drushify with your module name to make a, a basic um, template, and then you can fill this hook in and add um, your particular sanitization. So then drush will find your command file and uh, clear out that information. So finally, I'm going to go through some uh, Drush configuration things you can do to make your life easier quickly. Um, Drush configuration files are just PHP code. So <coughs> you can run any command that you want when you're setting up your function. Um, and the one example I'm showing here we call the grayside function because grayside uh, contributed this to the Drush queue and we put it into the examples folder, um, you know, we run git rev parse to find the root of your git directory, and then we set uh, options config, options include, and options alias path, um, and you can of course do a subset of these <coughs> to tell Drush that, you know, I would like to look for um, commands in this location, aliases in this location, or I'd like to source this specific Drush RC every time Drush loads up. Um, and I also want to call out this new Drush feature. If you treat this option like an array and append something to it, then it will add on to the configuration that Drush provides by default. So you're, you're adding an additional path or an additional file. If you get rid of the array and just assign a string to this function, That'll blow away the array that's already there, and then the paths that Drush adds by default will be overwritten. Um, so if you don't want to search the standard locations, you can get rid of them. So just to add on to that, the usefulness of this gray side um, example is that a team of developers can share Git, co Git configuration, or sorry, Drush configuration and aliases. Um, just by creating a Drush folder at the top of your Git repo, all right? And um, all the commands and aliases you put in there um, are gonna be shared by everyone just when they Git pull, all right? So it's a great way for teams to share their Drush stuff. Command files, aliases, and configuration. You can also do your configuration based on location. This is a little example um, of something that I do in my Drush configuration. I check to see if my current network gateway is the gateway that um, my company has set up. And if it is, then I set a context that says that I'm inside of you know, my company's intranet. And I use that context later inside of my aliases file so if I'm inside, uh, sorry, if I'm not inside of my company network, then I add additional SSH options to add um, a proxy command to send all of my SSH uh, connections through a Bastion server. So the result of this is uh, when I union this in with the, the parent um, directive on one of my aliases, then that says that this internal machine is internal to my company. And if I'm sitting outside of my company, then my SSHs to this machine will all go through this uh, intermediate bastion, which is pretty cool because it means I can use Drush commands on a site alias, and they work exactly the same whether I'm inside or outside of the firewall because I've provided these um, instructions on, on how to tunnel around through the, the firewall. And I actually use this for non-Drupal purposes because Drush has an SSH command and it has an rsync command and both of these commands recognize the SSH options that I set here 
Um, so you know, I can SSH into a specific work machine or rsync some deep folder of a work machine and I can just refer to its name by its Drush alias. And this is a, a pretty handy um, technique. Someone pointed out to me earlier that I should be using IP instead of route, but I didn't have time to change my example. So here's a bonus example. Um, you can also make yourself little shell aliases just to make Drupal better. And I've pulled up an example that comes from the Drush examples folder. Um, a certain anonymous <laughs> Drush contributor <laughs> um, made an editorial comment uh, that in the case of the examples folder was limited only to overlay and dashboard. So, so that the alias unsucks took out overlay and dashboard. Now, you may or may not think that overlay and dashboard suck, and in, in my case, I, I don't particularly like toolbar or shortcut. I prefer admin menu. And I don't really think they suck, but I just think that there's other contrib modules that work better for me. And since the unsuck command was there already, I just piggybacked on top of that so now if I go into a Drupal site, then I can just type drush unsuck, and it's going to strip out the stuff I don't like and put in the admin menu, and I say, ha, ah, I can find my admin pages again. <laughs> so I just never got used to those other things. I'm sure some people like them. But the point is, um, you know, if you make this little command, um, then it's, it's fast for you to set up your preferences. And there's lots of ways you can do this. You can set up features. Um, or whatever, but it's the right, it's the right command for the right, the right tool for the right time. Okay, so <coughs> that is pretty much the conclusion of the main content of the uh, presentation part today. And so now I'm gonna, in these next couple of talk slides, I'm gonna start talking about some things such as um, some contrib module statistics so we can slide into our post-presentation activities um, and you know, break up into groups or work independently. I'm gonna have a number of choices for things to do. But first I wanted to point out that um, when I cloned drupal.org uh, 7x modules, I found out that at the time I did it anyway, there were 5,495 of them. Um, Another, th another interesting thing about that is I read a really, interest, uh, really recent uh, Drupal Planet post that says that there were 7,200 some of them. So not too many weeks need to go by before this number grows fairly substantially. Um, but of these many modules that exist on drupal.org, only 429 of them have a drush.inc file. That's a little more than 5%. So one of the things I'm hoping today is that we can start getting this percentage up a little bit. Um, of those 427, 27 of them have a post PM enable hook. I think that's pretty impressive. That's, that's pretty appreciable. Um, but it would be even cooler if that number was higher because I think there are more than 27 contrib modules that have external libraries. And uh, you know, getting back to our XKCD command cartoon from the beginning, you could save a lot of time for a lot of people if you just implement one of these. Because you as the module maintainer know exactly what the library is and exactly where it goes, but your users take quite a few minutes to read through your documentation and, and figure that out. Um, and finally, of the 7,495 modules that I downloaded, only one of them had a sanitize hook, which was too bad. And I really wish that I had a prize to give out today. So I would like to give a prize to the person who could say which module implements the sanitize hook. I don't have any prizes. Do you have any takers? Anyone guess? Sorry? Migrate? No, it's not migrate. It's a good choice. Sorry? Drush. Drush itself. Oh. Not you a module. Not a yeah, okay, not a module. <laughs> you, you almost got the, I wasn't thinking of that prize. <laughs> um, <coughs> Any more? No, no more guesses? Okay, I'll, I'll spill the beans. The one and only one module that implements the sanitize hook is the paranoia module. 
<laughs> and the reason that's really ironic is that Paranaya only sanitizes core fields. So we made this hook, and zero contrib modules decided to sanitize their private fields. And I think that's because basically nobody knows about the sanitize hook. So I'm hoping that maybe today uh, some of the people present will say, gee, I know of some private fields in database tables of contrib modules that I use or maintain and maybe uh, add one of these because they're pretty quick to add and the huge advantage of adding one of these is if you want to sanitize your Drupal site, you don't really have a good way of knowing what your contrib modules are, are adding uh, in the way of user sensitive information. Uh, so finally, of the top 100 downloaded modules, according to drupal.org, 35 of them have a Drush Inc. file. And that's great, that's up to 35%, way more than 5%. But it still means that there's 65 modules that don't have a Drush.ink. Now perhaps some of these might be just API-y, like jQuery update probably doesn't need one. So some of these can be filtered out, it's not important. Um, but still, there's a lot of examples here. If you're looking for inspiration of something to experiment with, you could maybe pull something off of this list. Um, but it doesn't have to come from this list. If you brought a site today, um, you can maybe uh, ex enhance some module that has some tasks that you do frequently that you'd like to automate. Um, Another thing that you can do is uh, work through the bonus exercise that follows in the slides. I'm not going to do that up here because I figured that then this would turn into a two hour presentation and that would be brutal for you and for me. So we're not gonna do that, but there, the information is available in the, the slides and it's easy to step through. And those uh, slides, once again, are at drush.org slash prog. Yeah. You can download all the slides, including the bonus slides and work through them right now and we're here to help. Yeah, and I was just too jet lagged to have the bright idea to put the slides linked from my session page. But I'm gonna do that <laughs> right after this session. So if you forget drush.org prog, don't forget drush.org prog, but if you do, you can go back to the session page and shortly I'll have a link from there as well. Um, and so finally, after today, I'd like to call on everyone to participate. Uh, one of the great things about Drupal is how active all of the queues are. Um, and uh, you know, Drush is no exception. We've got our issue queue on GitHub, which is active today, and uh, you can contribute additional features, bug fixes, or feature requests. And uh, for support, we've migrated support over to Stack Exchange, and we've got a link to uh, this right on the project page um, in the readme file too. So if you have a question or you want to help answer questions, just head on over to uh, Stack Exchange. So I'm, I'm just gonna zip through the bonus slides so you can see that what they're he what's here in case you want to do it. Um, <coughs> in the bonus materials, I've used Drushify to make an example CCK command called create content type. Um, and uh, then I just show how you can modify the command record information that uh, hello uh, uh, that Drushify creates for you to have information that's relevant to your command. Um, and then I said since, I, since what I want to do is programmatically create a content type for CCK, I went out to the internet and I on Google I typed Drupal 7 programmatically create CCK content type. And I found a whole bunch of pages that all pretty much did the same thing. So I took one of those and I pasted it into the implementation instead of um, what Drushify gave me. And I ran it and, and it did something. And then I went through and I changed it to look at the command line options instead of the hard-coded stuff. And I made a Drush command in almost no time at all. So if you want to step through those steps, um, while there are people here to help you with them, you're welcome to do that. Or uh, 
do your own <coughs> modules, or we could also uh, break up into discussion groups if you have anything that you'd like to <coughs> talk about in terms of Drush futures or implementation, just find one of us and um, we can get something going. So if you have any suggestions, yes? Yes. Um, let's repeat. I'll, yeah, re yeah, I'll repeat okay. the question. So yeah, that's actually a complicated question. <laughs> um, uh, what are the advantages of using Drush Make or the post PM enable hook? Um, so I think the main use of Make is uh, to download all of the source code for a site. Um, the next step would be to install the site. Um, typically after a make. So that's very early on in a site's life cycle um, when you're using make. When you're using um, PM enable, it's, it can be a site that is a day or three years old or 10 years old. You're enabling a new module and you just want a library to come along for the ride. That's the typical use case for PM enable. Um, if you're using make on a site that's been around for a long time, you're you're in sort of a team developer workflow, um, and it's a little bit of a specialized use case. I think when you're in that use case, using Make for that is fine. Um, I think there is some overlap, but I think the PM enable case is kind of like the common man. Lots of people do it lots of times, and the Make case is very special developer team kind of thing. Yeah, I, I want to add something to that too, because uh, a year or two ago, I got into this idea where um, there was actually a couple blog articles about you know every Drupal site is an install profile. It's like, yeah, that's a great idea. So the first thing I'm gonna do when I make a new Drupal site is I'm gonna make an install profile and I'm gonna type in all of the modules I need. And, and, and I felt so accomplished and, and rigorous doing this. And then I also found that my productivity fell down <laughs> to like by a factor of 10. I'm like, oh my God, I can't. Oh yeah. <laughs> I can't deal with this. So what I did was I switched back to the DL and enable workflow, and uh, after I had a site that sort of worked for me, then I wrote a code generator that made an install profile out of an, a running site. Um, and that works for Drupal 7, and it doesn't have the template files for Drupal 6, which is why for more than a year it hasn't been committed. It was, it was more than a year in the Drush queue, and it recently moved over to the module builder queue. The maintainer there said, hey, I'll take this, um, when we closed all of the old Drush issues. Um, so uh, after this conference, I'll probably work on that. And th then there's also, the, you know, Moshe's question, answer was best, it's pragmatic. But I, I also want to give a really niggling answer, and, and that is inside of Drush Make, there was an idea for, ex for um, modules to provide their own make files and have, yeah, oh, and you did that. Okay, Th there's a huge issue, and I can't even get into the issues in the issue about why it's not very convenient for uh, a module to do this. And, and one of the reasons is if you don't want it, then you have to put in what I call a don't hurt me flag. You know, I'd rather say, you know, if I want something, then add it in. Um, and uh, you know, for the record, we do have a don't hurt me flag in the PM enable thing as well. Um, but <laughs> um, yeah, it, as Moshe said, it's, it's the right tool for the right situation. Um, and make is a good way to do that as well. Yes? It shouldn't, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, let me answer the question. First, the, the question is, would there be a conflict if you added a post-enable hook, is that going to screw up your install profile? 
And uh, the answer is no, because when you run the install profile, it doesn't use Drush to enable the module. So the, the Drush post and enable hook is only going to run when you PM enable from Drush. It's not going to run if you enable from the UI or from an install profile. Any more Q and A? <laughs> yeah, if you, if you, yeah, if you turn it on with features using Drush, then you're also not using PN and enable, and you do n not automatically download the, the library. You know, I'd, I'd have to look at the implementation. <laughs> um, to say why, because I, I don't know about the implementation of, of features, if it calls invoke or whatever. Or, and maybe I'm even wrong. Maybe it does do it. Yes? The, mod the model is that the maintainer picks the version that's best, but if there's multiple versions that might be relevant to the users of that module, you can use the um, Drush uh, help alter hook to add a flag, and then they could specify the version that they wanted in a flag to PM enable. Or you could even go so far as to call um, Drush choice from inside of your hook and prompt the user for which one they wanted. I would tend to discourage interactive input inside of PM enable. That wasn't expected, um, but it is an option if, if you want that. Kay. Any more questions? All right, well, um, I bet a couple of us will be in the back of the room. If anyone wants to get a little circle together and do a quick Drush boff, um, we're happy to do that kind of discussion thing. A bunch of us will be walking around help you, helping you get through these slides and helping you get through your own Drush commands also. All right. Great. Thank you all. And, and definitely do give us feedback, okay? You guys have heard this instruction many times, but the feedback is really helpful for us and for the Drupal Association. Thanks. And this is our first time doing a Drush Lab with this many people trying to figure out you know, the right experience level and the, the right activities. So if you've got constructive criticism or, or suggestions about how we might structure it differently next time, let us know. <laughs>